let me begin with some statistics here. Guys, we're fat and we know it. <laughs> and the growth rates literally are in the double digits. You know, what's scary about it is that we are leapfrogging into those first world problems of diabetes, hypertension, and obesity before we realize it. And unless we do something about it, we'll be there pretty soon. The good part, though, is that we have a mobile revolution happening in this country. We've got the power of smartphones in the hands of people, and we can use technology to alter our lifestyles a little bit. Now, I'm not telling you you need to go stop eating your aloo panatas and your beloved gulab jamuns, but uh, little bit by little bit, by taking small steps, we can do it. And that is what I'm currently trying to do in my role as the founder and CEO of Healthify Me, as a health tech entrepreneur. But you know, today is not about my journey as an entrepreneur, really. It's about what led me to this journey and the journey of these last 10 years that has got me back to my roots and um, got me working towards the country. So let me rewind that and let me go back 10 years. 2003, I was in Delhi. I was in Delhi College of Engineering. To be honest, I was really not in the college at any given time much because I was found mostly outside the college, outside the classes. I was working with the Ministry of Culture. I was doing a lot of work in the field of music. I was doing a lot of work starting these organizations for street children, doing a lot of work in global conventions. And luckily, thanks to a lot of that work, I got a recommendation by the former president of Germany, Richard Weizsacker, that led me to transferring to University of Pennsylvania midway. And uh, while there, my dream was, like any other person's dream is, at the age of 19 or 20, to be a Wall Street investment banker. And boom, I was there in 2007. I couldn't feel more at top of life when, you know, I was with Deutsche Bank and I was going around the world. I went to San Francisco in their office there, did about a year there. And from there on, went to Singapore for another two years. But something felt missing, especially as my student loans finished, and I was ready to sort of, I felt independent and free, I lost the sense of purpose. And I was thinking at that time what to do about life. And the thought of the same street children came to my mind. And the thought in the faces of people of India came to my mind. And I realized that the whole reason I got to, the, to that summit was because of those very people. And I couldn't bear not being able to work for them. I felt extremely disconnected. And I was looking for opportunities, looking for areas where I could create an impact and that's when I came across the unique ID project, the biggest project ever undertaken by any government in the history of mankind in 2009, and I reached out to the team. Nandan Nilekhani was very kind enough to give me an offer and say, just come join the team. Um, I was dissuaded by a lot of people, most certainly by my senior bankers who said I was doing a grave injustice to my family, a family of humble government servants on government salaries, and that I should really be in the business of making money right now at that age, but at age 24 somehow, I knew I had to do it, and I had the conviction to just take a leap. That got me to uh, Bangalore in the Aadhaar project, the Unique ID project. It was a fascinating experience. I would do it again and again every single time if I, if I could. I worked with some of the smartest people in the world in the field of technology, entrepreneurship, and government, all working in literally one apartment to begin with in Bangalore, trying to do nation building. And I worked across the government in various government fields in the public distribution system, in the oil and gas infrastructure, with the government of India, various state governments, to really figure out how the Aadhaar as a product can help improve uh, their delivery systems. I also got a chance to travel around the country and meet people, look them in the eye and understand what their real grassroots problems were, how Aadhaar as a product could help improve their lives for the better. I wrote all my analyses in fascinating reports full of a lot of data-backed economic insights for the government to take forward but even then, something didn't quite, just didn't complete. It, the whole experience still felt like I was looking at that average Indian from a glass wall. I was analyzing that average Indian, but I couldn't really feel, couldn't really understand deeply what it means to be that person. And that's when I took my second plunge, to live on 100 rupees a day and 32 rupees a day for a month, to truly experience what it feels like to be an average Indian. It's a small amount of money, guys, if you think about it. It's a very tiny amount of money, and we felt for the first time in our lives, deep hunger. And to those who haven't experienced it, it is devastating, it is frustrating. After that experiment, I learned a lot of things, and you know, one of the things I learned was that somehow those shoves that you get in the buses and the rudeness that you see from auto rickshaw drivers doesn't seem that bad. You get very forgiving because you know what it feels like when you're living off an empty belly. Our lives look uh, very hard during that time, but I was lucky to be joined by two fascinating people. One who, would my, who was my uh, roommate who joined me in this experiment, who would become my co-founder later, 
uh, Matt Charian, and the other one was Tristha, who was a big supporter, who subsequently became my wife. Hey, great things happen when you do crazy stuff. <laughs> um, thank you. This is how life looked like on 100 rupees a day. I only had 50 rupees for food and only 50 for non-food. Besides hunger, it was a life of difficult choices. I couldn't choose to have a fridge and an and internet and TV. I had to choose one. You know, it was, a, it was a difficult life, guys. It's not easy for people to live on that. It was also a restraining life. We felt imprisoned in a five-kilometer circle of life because we could have only eight rupees for transportation. And in eight rupees, even using buses, you can't travel more than five kilometer. So literally, you can imagine that 75% of this country is imprisoned in a five-kilometer radius prison and has to live and dwell there. 32 was just crazy. I mean, we were starving completely. Right. I lost, by the way, six kilos in that one experiment. So actually, if you want to reduce weight, that's not a bad idea, but definitely not in a healthy way. And you can see that our diet completely changed to a carbs-only diet. We were only eating rice and nothing else because we couldn't afford anything else. To travel anywhere, we had to walk. Here are some glimpses of us making roti, which didn't look more like an India map, to be honest. <laughs> and uh, moving into our servant quarters made room, because uh, we wanted to experience life, splitting a bathroom soap because we couldn't afford a full one, literally drinking drops of tea because milk is white gold, and traveling in local trains, living with a village farmer, um, eating his food, basically all rice and carbs dominated, hardly any protein in there, but some positivity. This is Uman Chandi, the chief minister of Kerala. We walked four kilometers to his home, stood an hour, two hours in the line, and were wondering if we could get to meet the chief minister of a state, but just walking up there, and guess what? We did. That is the power of democracy in this country, guys. It works. We wrote about our insights in a lovely blog. Uh, you know, first, we thought it was an experiment just for self-journey, but suddenly we were joined by researchers, scholars, students from around the world, the experiment went viral on Facebook. We got covered by journalists from all around the world. And before we knew it, we were on the world map, very importantly. And the government couldn't ignore us, policymakers couldn't ignore us, and we had a platform to lobby a certain, a certain insights. And that we did. We brought to the government notice that everybody in India today has a cell phone, the smartphone. They have the phone, they cannot pay for the data connectivity. So if only you can subsidize 2G and 3G plans, suddenly you'll have all of the country connected. Seems like a simple enough problem. Seems like only 100 rupees per BPL family cost. We presented it to the Planning Commission, and I don't know if it was in spite of us or because of us, but about a month later, the Planning Commission did propose this uh, to the government of India. So that felt really good um, as an impact. <laughs> Unfortunately, the government of India did strike it down at that time, though just last month, we, we came, uh, it did come out with a 5,000 crore government subsidy. So we're excited to see how this progress is, and would love your support too. But another big insight was that adequate nutrition was tough. This is how life looks like on 32 rupees a day. It's 82% carbs. Does it explain diabetes? Does it explain early arthritis? Does it explain early retirement? We definitely believe so, right? And we went to the government and saying, hey, listen, you really need to fortify this with protein-rich substitutes, with, with fiber-rich substitutes. We didn't quite meet a lot of traction there with the government, but what we did realize is a byproduct of the experiment, that to track this data, we found it very hard to do it. There were no good calorie and nutrition tracking tools available for the country. And as Matt and I sat across, sat across the table and figured out what should we do next, we thought health entrepreneurship is where it's at. And we should go about building the world's first Indian calorie tracker. It wasn't an easy experience. Thus began my third journey in this country, which is what I'm currently living today, two years ago, early 2012. And we partnered up with National Institute of Nutrition with certain really phenomenal teammates. We were situated in Bangalore in the Microsoft Accelerator. And over a course of one year of hard work, fellows, we built the world's first Indian calorie tracker, full of 10,000 Indian foods. Thank you. <laughs> that you can click and understand what it means like to have that gulab jamun. What does it mean for protein, fats, carbs, and other things? And using our app today, a lot of people have found a lot of benefit. They have undergone significant lifestyle changes. And we continue this journey. My journey, ladies and gentlemen, is far from being complete. It has just started. But whatever I've done, I've done with a deep love for this country and for its people. And one thing that this country has taught me in return is that if you do things with a deep sense of conviction, right, however crazy they are, it usually leads to great things. Um, and I'm going to leave you with a message that I feel very passionately about for the youth of this people. Um, it says, go be crazy, go win the world. Um, it's a, long, a little song I wrote while I was an investment banker. Um, Thank you.
Thank you very much for listening to me.